Welcome to life on earth. Welcome to life on earth. Welcome to life on earth. Hello, you good people, and welcome to life on earth. This may be the best life on earth since at least last week. This is going to be an amazing episode. It's going to be the best. You know, why is the show called Life on Earth? Didn't like Dave and Attenborough already make a series? We're going to get sued one of these days. But the reason the show is called Life on Earth is because Ayn Rand said. Mm, what'd she say? Formally, I call my philosophy objectivism, but informally, I call it a philosophy for living on Earth. Uh -huh. One of the great changes in the last 10, 20, 30 years being involved in objectivism is watching people not just use this philosophy to argue politics, even though that's certainly the most important thing you can do with objectivism is get on the internet and argue politics, <laughs> but actually apply these ideas to their lives. And we've talked about that in many of our episodes. It's great to see objectivists are just going out there. They're chasing success, financial success, personal success. They've got the mind body thing going. Objectivists aren't overweight and smoking cigarettes anymore. So many ways that we're seeing- <laughs> Look at those guns of Luke's there. <laughs> so many ways people are applying this philosophy to life on earth, but I don't know anybody who's doing it in a more stylized, admirable way that makes us all say, I want to be like that guy then. Uh -huh. Today's guest. Today I we are talking to Luke Travers. I love you, Luke. <laughs> I love you, Amy. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> Luke is, is, is an art expert, but I personally think of him as an art experience designer because he, well, that's what he does. And we're going to talk about that. So Luke, welcome to Life on Earth. How are you doing tonight? I'm doing wonderfully. I'm doing wonderfully in this life on Earth. This only life I get, this only life I get to cherish. So, and to spend time with you too is just icing on the cake. An A-plus answer, which you would expect from Luke, because not only is he an art expert and art experience designer, but he is also a teacher by profession. Yes. In fact, Luke, if you could give us a little bit of your background, how on earth, how on life on earth did you get to being not just an art expert, as if that wasn't enough, but somebody who makes other people better appreciators of art? at the same time as being an actual educator in places besides music, how did you get to be doing what you yeah. do? What's, what's, what's the story here? Was, was art <laughs> your, 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 your college degree or your, your educational background? How did you get here? Well, it all started in 1979 uh, on December 10th when I was born. Um, <laughs> Well, good job with that. Oh, Luke. Nice Luke. work. Um, uh, there, you know, when you look back at your early days of your life and when the direction your career goes into, you, you kind of think back, oh, this was a pivotal moment. For me, in terms of teaching and sharing values with other people, I knew in the moment that it happened when I was 20, that it was a pivotal moment. It wasn't, through, retros it wasn't through retrospection that I, I figured out, oh, that was significant. It was right then and there, once it happened, I said to myself, I am gonna be doing this the rest of my life. So would you like to hear a little story? Yeah, yes. uh, yeah, I'm eager to It's hear an exciting what story. Was. It's an exciting story of me teaching algebra. Algebra. Ooh, so <laughs> I didn't fun. expect the, this to be algebra. <laughs> okay, what is the story? I'm sure it's great. What is it? Well, you see, um, I, 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 I grew up as a Lego kid, you know, a kid like in their Legos, not talking to people. When, when I had to sell raffle tickets in fourth grade, yeah, yeah, my sister, and yes, she came with me because I was too shy to go up and knock at people's doors, and she's the outgoing one. So you would say, you know what, like talking to people and interacting with people was not the thing that my life was leading towards. But, That's good because a lot of people in objectivism, well, I shouldn't say that that way. A lot of us, a lot of yeah, folks lot in, of in our circle yes. are, are shy. So it's great that you had an enabler or a mentor maybe sounds less. An inspiration person, yeah. you know, that you, yeah. that you got inspiration Well, but somebody from. to drag Kind of, more doors. like an antagonist. My sister was my antagonist. Now we get along much better now, but, but you know, like we, we had different personality types. Um, but I, I started dabbling in, in teaching. I like talking about dinosaurs. And there, and I started to, to make money after high school. I started substitute teaching, which was a glorified babysitting position where I could just, uh, you know, sit and read and, and philosophy because I was into philosophy. 
Um, but there was one day where I was asked to actually do some teaching. The, the teacher was going to be gone for like a week and I was there and it was an algebra class. And did gosh, that require training or credentials? Uh, no, 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 not, not in Tennessee in uh, 1997. Um, in Tennessee, no. Okay. No, I just had just a GED, which, you know, I barely got, but I got it. Um, and, and so I was, I was substitute teaching like this, you know, sophomore high school class. And, and so tell you know what you're doing. Well, no, I did not know, but I was glad I had the first period free. I had the first period free, which was great because I could brush up on my algebra. So I took that first period. And you know what? I was going to be teaching the same class six times over, six straight times. So wow. I thought, okay, better, I better get this down. So I, I brushed up on my algebra and I went in there with all the confidence in the world to teach that first algebra class. Total disaster. Absolutely total disaster. I had no idea what I was talking about. The students were like, oh, come on. When is this over? I was thinking uh, if you were in the sixth period, you know, maybe you were going to get Luke by the time you knew what he was doing. And you know what? I had this like seven minute gap between each class. And so <laughs> during like the transition from one class to another, because I, I had to move to a different class, I, I started figuring out, okay, what can I do to, you know, improve a little bit? And the next period was a little bit better. And then the, you know, seven minute gap and the next period was a little bit better. And, and it progressively got better and better until the last period as you're, uh, uh, you're you know, foretelling there, Robert. It was the amazingly fun. Oh, great. <laughs> oh my goodness. I, I was, I knew exactly what kinds of things the students would be saying. I was, uh, I was, I knew how to present the material. They were raising their hands up. And I came out of that last period of the day feeling elated. I remember oh, the great. way that I was walking down the hallways. I remember like, you know, strutting, like lifting my legs uh, high up in the air and kind of bouncing. You know how you, if you have that feeling? No, no, not frolicking. It was more frolicking. It's like, no, no. It was more like I am, I am. Floating. I feel like I was like a, the, this, this um, floating march. Transcendent marsh. being. Yeah. Yes, yes, yes. This, it's kind of floating march. Like I, it was, and I, I <laughs> Looking back, I realized this is like the first time I really felt publicly efficacious. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Um, and and I, I knew then and there that in some form, teaching was going to be part of the rest of my life. Mm -hmm. So that, that would be kind of the origin story. Now, Robert, I know you're talking about art. Um, and I do have an origin story for the art part. Yeah, we could, we could talk about art some. <laughs> <laughs> I'm digging the algebra thing, you know. Yeah, well, I just I we, love that we, story, Luke. I mean, because and I, th I think a lot of people need to hear that kind of story more often because sometimes you just have to kind of sink or swim and jump into it and see if you're good, and then you find out delightfully that you you surprising yourself and you did it. So well, it's we're all ambitious. We all have faced that relentless pursuit of excellence, and we know at the beginning it can be less than excellent, but mm -hmm. how many people get it in six class periods <laughs> going from, mm -hmm. oh my God, that was terrible to, I am the God of education. <laughs> yeah. And the God of education, God has come up since many times. I, I'm still <laughs> learning uh, how to teach every class period. Even this past week, I'm like, oh my goodness, that was frustrating. Why didn't that work? But it's the attitude that I had where I, I want to keep learning from what I did and the mistakes I made to try to next time I deliver, next time I teach, I'm changing something up to, to make the experience better. So that, I love that moniker you gave me. What is it, the, um, the designer of an artistic experience? What did you call it? Yes, yes, you are. You are yeah, an art. So and it, when we talk about, when we talk about the first book, Touching the Art, I, I can't think of a better description of what, because you've done this with us and we'll get there. We'll talk about mm -hmm. some of the museums we've been in other states that we've been in with you, but you do that. You you design the art experience and the teacher that you are, you take people through that so they can have that experience. Not everybody does that. And you know better than I do what most people do when they go to an art museum. Oh, which, I sure do. Which is they go in and they enjoy it and they love the art, but they kind of get a little taste of a lot of things and they don't take very much home with them. Mm -hmm. And Other. that was me, Robert. That that yeah. was me. That 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 was absolutely me. I I I did the same thing, and I I did the same thing professionally. Well, kind of professionally, because I after I dropped out of the philosophy program, I decided, oh wow, 
I want to get into art history. And the reason I want to get art history, because I saw art history as a concretization of philosophy. Look at the ancient Greek art and how it reflects their culture and their sense of life. Look at the medieval art look at, and, and how it reflects theirs. Look at, look at Renaissance and so forth. So I was very into the philosophical questions yeah. applied to the visual arts and seeing the sense of life, the philosophy of different time periods of different artists manifested in the art. And that was very exciting for me. But it wasn't an art experience. Right. It was a philosophic art historical experience. Sure. And as so, a teacher, yeah. that's not unusual. You, you have to give people at some point, you have to give them the survey of philosophy and philosophers, the survey of art. Um, but yeah, you don't get that deep into it. It's kind of like taking a bite of a thousand different foods and never really settling on one and enjoying it. I, I kind of like that analogy. Yeah. I was trying to think about it a little bit more. And it's, uh, it's that, you know, romantic partners. Yeah. You're going on Tinder and you're flipping right or flipping left and you respond, you, you get a sense of the photos or you're just going out to a dance or the club or wherever and you're, and you're getting first impressions of people. And some of them are going to like really hit you. Oh, wow. She looks amazing or uh, kind of boring, whatever it is. You get that first in a lot. I think a, I have a sense that a lot of the sense of life response comes in that first immediate reaction. But then that's the first instance. There is so much more after that. What are you going to do together? What are you having kind of fun? What are you going to talk about? All these things that are part of building a relationship together that are in addition to it. And I kind of see the visual arts in the same way. You, you get that first, oh, that looks dramatic or that looks intense or that looks beautiful. But then what are you going to do to continue the relationship? Yes. <laughs> That's yes. a great analogy. And how am I going to make that mine? Yeah. Not in terms of possession, but yeah. in terms of my psychology, my experience, yeah. my values. Yeah. If that's the world that I want to live in, I want to make that world mine. Yeah. Wonderful. Absolutely. Well, so we have some more questions here for you. Where would mm -hmm. you like to, where would you like to go right now? Would you like to go <laughs> to an artwork right now? Or would you like to get into more of your, your uh, upcoming work? Uh, what do you think? Well, I think before we get into an artwork, we at least need to get to the point in the story where we are yeah. touching the art. Yes. So I wanted to ask real quick, what is the relationship of your day job as a teacher? Mm -hmm. Because you teach literature. Well, how do you relate that to then your second job, your project, which is the, the touching the art project? How, how did these, did these co-evolve or did one lead to the other? Yeah, yeah, that's a, that's a great question. So shortly after that algebra uh, revelation, I I decided I wanted to teach, but I also decided I wanted I didn't want to teach at a public school because I'd done three years of substitute teaching, and the primary reason I didn't want to teach at a public school is because I wouldn't be able to create my own curriculum. Now I got very lucky and got a job at a small private school in Southern California called Van Dam Academy, mm -hmm. where I had the opportunity to to teach literature right off the bat, elementary students, and then junior high students. And during that time, I was also starting to try to um, approach a more literary kind of style of experiencing the art. Um, and so I was giving tours. Um, and the first tour that I gave that I felt like, wow, this is the kind of approach that that mirrors literature, that mirrors watching movies the most was, uh, I think, 2006 at the Boston Museum of Fine Arts. Mm -hmm. And on this tour, I did not do any art history. I did not do, because previously I did, I did not do any analysis of the composition or the style. I don't think I even mentioned the artist's names. But what we did was oh, we wow. spent time with three stories, three stories that we immersed ourselves in and then personally connected to. And this is the kind of approach that you kind of naturally have towards reading a novel or, or watching a movie. You just immerse yourself into the character story. You care about them. You, you imagine that what's going on is real. And that's what we did on that Boston tour in 2006. And lucky for me, Elisa Van Dam, who was, you know, the director of Van Dam Academy came on that tour. And after the tour, she said, Hey Luke, can you do that in the classroom? <laughs> and so from that point forward, I started creating an art appreciation class at Van Dam Academy that nice. mirrored what was going on in literature. And so jump forward to the day where I have my business literature at our house, where we teach um, literature to homeschool students across the country, 
we also do art appreciation. And so both in the kind of content in, the, in my career, like literature and art kind of going together, but also in, in the fundamental approach that we have towards the arts, they're fully integrated. In fact, the things that I've started, I started to do with the visual arts, I started to I like apply to, uh, to literature. So one of the things you talked about, Robert, is making the artwork your own. And that's a very important concept for me. And it's something that I didn't do explicitly with literature. I kind of read along and say, oh, this story of Hunchback of Notre Dame is wonderful. It's great. It's moving. Or the Cyrano Bergerac, fantastic. Or, you know, Anna Green Gables. Oh, I really like her. But there was, I had to ask myself more explicit questions for the visual arts to get the same kind of experience. Like, do I know this kind of person? When have I been in this kind of moment? And that practice of being more explicit in my own mind to ask these questions because there are no words in, in, with an artwork. You got to provide the words. You got to provide the questions to get the most out of it. That practice of doing that and mining the artwork for more is something that I've then transferred over to literature where I can take those similar kinds of questions and ask myself, who in my life is an Anne of Green by Gables? When have I been in this moment that Cyrano de Bergerac has been in? Am I like Quasimodo? In what ways? And mm -hmm. so that kind of more explicit uh, conscientious, conscious questioning that I would apply to the visual arts by necessity is something that I could easily transfer and, and make my appreciation, make my students' appreciation for literature blossom even more. Well, I did not expect that not only would literature then, would you look at literature and say, how do I do this with art, but then go back from art to literature. I swear my notes here just say, relationship to your day job as a teacher of literature. I did not intend to throw you a softball, but that's an outstanding <laughs> explanation there. I didn't realize. Um, oh, and it make, Robert, and it makes, I Robert, should have realized it goes Robert, in both directions, but. Right. Wait, in 15 years, wait for my book on the unified theory of appreciating all the arts. Okay. <laughs> yes. Well, that, that gets to my last question of the session. Folks are going to have to wait for that. And folks are, they are mm -hmm. on. We've got a couple of super chats already. Mary Aline, the uh, doyen of, of the Ayn Rand Center UK, the, the benefactress of all things ARC UK has already chimed in a couple of times on the super chat. Also, the shadow blade contributing two pounds says life on earth highlight of my Thursday. Well, thank you for that. And uh, especially today, this yes. interview, I'm sure will be the highlight of your week. Um, so I have to go because we do want to do a bit of art appreciation right on the show. I have to jump from that to your first book. I I almost don't have a question because it now seems obvious. How did touching the art become, how, how did it, how did what you were doing become this book, this project, and these sessions with people like Great Lakes Objectivists and countless other groups that you've led around? How did yeah. that happen? Oh, well, it's, it's, it's basically somebody telling me, hey, Luke, stop being selfish, be more selfish. It's not, you know, you got this method. We go on your tours. This is fantastic. But how about telling us a little bit about how you do this? Like, give us a game plan here. And why don't you like put together some questions or something? I started putting together some questions and it turned into a book. And mm -hmm. so it became Touching the Art 10 years ago became uh, uh, the how to book for the fundamental method and the techniques that I, I would apply in art museum. So that's that book. Mm -hmm. Now, it's great. I love it. But it's still something that you would pick up by yourself and, mm -hmm. you know, get a piece of paper and, and, and you know, practice like a miniature course. It's mm -hmm. not an art tour. It's got five artworks that you, they'll take you through, but it's not an art tour. Right. So, Robert, I'm going to anticipate that your next question is going to be about my forthcoming book. And I want to differentiate touching the art from this forthcoming book that I'm, oh, hopefully almost well finished writing. The rumor has it is that there's this forthcoming book of yours that you have on uh, that you actually um, put up on Kickstarter and you met your goal, you exceeded your goal and that book, as I believe it's called Stories in Paint. That's yeah, <laughs> so, so the so rumors travel tell us quickly. About that. <laughs> so, so you're saying that, um, you know, whereas touching the art is something that you pick up and you you bring to the art museum and you study for yourself, this, this new book is going to do something even you know, even even more extensive than that. Oh, this new book is not a how-to book. This okay. new book is here mm. are 50 art experiences that are ready made that you can have now. Mm. It's like um, it's taking the 15 years I've been giving art tours 
and gathering up the best of the best of the artworks, the most uh, powerful ones, the most moving ones, all these experiences that I've had on my on tours and gathering these 50 artworks, mm -hmm. making a kind of simple little few questions to help you get into the artwork yourself and then providing my own reading of the artwork. Mm -hmm. So I'm going to give you a crazy analogy. Are you ready right. for a crazy analogy? I'm ready. Always. So I'm here to catch it. <laughs> um, now, now, good. <laughs> so you, you think of reading a novel where you have all the words and to complete the experience. I think I've talked to you guys about this. You, um, you provide the mental images mm -hmm. to it and you, you got to see what Quasimodo looks like. You got to see what, if you can picture Anne of Green Gables with a red hair, it's going to be even more vivid and more engaging. You're creating the reality in your mind's eye for the novel. You got it. I love the, I love the <laughs> hair, by the way, Amy. And, <laughs> and so if you don't do that, you're, you're not fully immersing yourself in the experience of the novel. That doesn't mean that in the 19th century, especially, or even today, but especially in the 19th century, you wouldn't pick up a Victor Hugo novel and it would be filled with illustrations, magnificent illustrations of, of what you know, Claude Frollo is doing and what uh, Captain Phoebus looks like. And you would be really engaged to look at those illustrations. Oh, what does Quasimodo, the hunchback, the gross looking hunchback really look like? Now, the really is, of course, that illustrator's mental image of it. Right. Now. Yeah. This book, Stories and Paint, is kind of the reverse of that. Okay. You, you have the images, and I'm going to provide my readings, my stories, my words to go along with that. Just like in the 19th century, the reverse, they would provide their illustrations for the text. Because one of the main things that I, I, I highly recommend as part of completing your art experience is to provide your words. Now, all the engagement that I'm going to encourage you to do is to read the artwork on your own. But that doesn't mean it's it's not fun to see somebody else's reading. True. So you get my reading of the artwork along with that. Wow. Yeah. And there's more to it than that. Of course, you know that. But the folks hearing this don't. There, there are... There are links, QR codes, which oh. of course all the kids are into, that will give you <laughs> even more. But but just coming to the book, if folks understand your method of art immersion and and art immersion isn't even the right word. Touching, making it yours, they might be left with the question: Well, okay, but Luke Travers goes around and does this. And what folks don't know, if they haven't taken one of your tours or haven't been that involved in the planning of one of your tours, mm -hmm. Luke will come into your town where you have a decent art museum <laughs> i'll be there will, soon <laughs> and he will come well but luke will show up a day or two ahead of time he'll knock on your door and he will go to the museum without any of y'all with him and luke will find the gems mm. yeah and mm. they won't even necessarily be the the, the rembrandt right. or the bougarot right. he will find the art the kind of art that you will have stories about, that you will make stories about. And people I'm sure have come to you and said, well, I like your idea. Now, how do I find the art? Yeah. And yeah. now, now you can find the art and something like twice as much of your goal on Kickstarter has been busted out because folks want that. So it's uh, it's an extraordinary project. The links are on Twitter and my Facebook wall, a list of links of everything you're going to want to see after this discussion those of you who, of course, are multitaskers are probably already looking at the links to stories and paint and touching the art and other links that I've put up there. But th that is what makes, I mean, th there are a lot of art books. People say, oh, I want to get more into art. I need to buy an art book. And there are plenty of art books, but none of them will, will bring you into the art the way uh, you know, we've seen samplers of the book, even pre-release, the way that this book will do. So, so Robert, you called Luke an art experience designer yes. and, uh, and a curator for this art. He comes to your town, he knocks on your door, and he goes to your art museum and he finds, and, and okay, by the way, Robert and I have been on Luke's tours, I think five or six times throughout the years. And We, we everyone... have been on these tours in Chicago, Illinois. We've been on them in Austin, Texas. Mm -hmm. uh, obviously, not just Detroit, Michigan, but Flint, Michigan has a surprisingly good museum. Yes. Uh, I, I, I may even be forgetting some of the places that we've gone on these tours and they have evolved, or at so, least there's been enough variety that we don't even feel like we're doing the same thing each time. This most recent one in Austin was extraordinary yeah, it was. And, and had a, a whole different feel to it. 
So I'm really, really looking forward to reading this because I know from firsthand experience over and over again, consistently <laughs> that Luke just brings out the best of, a, of an artwork. And he just absolutely amazes me. And I can't wait to read it. That's, <laughs> that's, that's the bottom line of it. It's, uh, he is, you are a curator, Luke, and I really, I really, really appreciate your, your powers of observation, your attention to detail, your imagination, and your surprising ability to show us an artwork what, during one of your tours, and, and, and we'll look at it, and we'll be like, meh, meh. Good, good, good. <laughs> then, I'm, I'm glad about and then, that. And then afterwards, you, you, you know, you, you do your magic on it for about five minutes, and everyone is looking at it a little bit more intently, a little bit more intently, and the story comes out. And you, then everybody starts feeling very emotional about it. I know I've had this experience many times uh, with, with paintings that I never thought that I would ever dream of enjoying, of getting immersed into, of, of wanting to be in that world. And so you have provided that for me and, uh, and, and, and in book form, that's going to reach a lot of people and your take on that particular artwork is going to be very valuable. Uh, so... <laughs> Amy, I know in a pre-show, um, we're chatting a little bit about you. You had a question for me about, um, you know, when mm -hmm. have I gotten emotional about art? I, yes, uh, you know, yeah, when have right. I, when have I cried? Do <laughs> I cry in front of the artwork? Tell me when you, will you cry now, Luke? <laughs> we did. We, we did a whole episode of our show on the things that make you cry in that good or, yes. or, or even cathartic way, but in that joyous way. Yes. But Crying is whether good. sad or happy, what, what, what gets to you? Yeah, because the, because you see so much art, reaction. don't so, you kind of get uh, used to that? Here, here's here's the, the basis of an answer. It's a connection that I make in, a, in my mind that brings the laughter, that brings the tears, that brings the inspiration. It's not something in the artwork that then hits me. It's mm -hmm. something that I start to realize or something that a question that I asked that then suddenly my subconscious feeds me an answer to. And when that answer comes and it's the yeah. right answer for that moment, it, it makes it powerful. And I'm glad to give you a couple of examples if you like. Yes, please. All right. So now this is obviously without the artworks, but just to give you an indication of the kinds of connections that happen that can happen and that, that trigger the emotions for me. I remember the first time I laughed out loud in a museum spontaneously, uh, startling the security guard. And this was at the <laughs> Huntington Library um, in, in, in Pasadena, California. And there's this British portrait of a family, like two kids and a, and a sister, older sister or mom or somebody. And one of the kids is wearing pants. And that's it. And, and one of the kids is wearing pants. That's it. That's it. That well, I'm not. I'll, maybe I'll in the show notes or something afterwards. I'll give you the title. But but I want to ex. I, this, I, the thing I'm stressing here is how plain this seemed. And then what I did was I started to realize a little bit of what was going on, and and started to realize that like oh this is a little bit of a rite of passage, and you know, 19th, 18th century British kids, boys would start wearing dresses, and then the day that they wore pants was like a big day. And this guy and this little kid looks really, really, really proud. And then I started, I asked myself the question, do I know anybody like this who would have that kind of proud posture as a kid who looks so happy to have his pants? And then suddenly, perhaps intimately, <laughs> so, some, some, suddenly my friend Lee Sandstead came to mind. Oh, and I immediately saw Lee there and I burst out laughing and I couldn't <laughs> help myself but think that's Lee. That's the same attitude. That's him. And so I, we know Lee Sanstead at least for a while back. And I understand what you're saying. It's that's wonderful. It's a wonderful observation. So that that but that that asking myself a question and, and sometimes I don't get an answer back from my subconscious. It's a fickle mistress, my subconscious. But sometimes I do. And Okay, I'll give you one for, for tears. Now, that was me thinking. Now, the mm -hmm. other source is when I'm sharing artwork with others. Because one of the things, um, Robert, you've talked about how you know, my, my thinking has evolved. One of the ways in which it has really evolved with our appreciation is how social art is. Mm -hmm. How much more social it can be than the other forms of art. With a movie, shh, quiet. We got a, the, the, the story's going. With a novel, you're creating on your mind's eye the images. It's your world that you're creating. With an artwork, 
you're providing words to complete the experience. But if you're with a group of people, you can all contribute to those to that experience with those words. And somebody's noticing some things you aren't, and then or they're or they're using uh, language or particular words that you find uh, particularly illuminating. And then when you get to thinking of personal connections, then you can see how you might bond with them because they're going to share something that might be they would not normally share. Uh, just out of the blue, but they will share as a way to connect with the artwork and then connect with you. But I'll give you one instance of um, a moving moment. And this was just this past summer at the Museum of Fine Arts, Boston. Um, and it, we just, I just spent time uh, with my friend, Cynthia, Cynthia Roth, mm -hmm. and we were in front of a painting and we spent 20 minutes just reading this artwork together. And um, we're walking away from it. And then I suddenly thought to myself, oh, I haven't even asked the, you know, one of the most pivotal questions to experiencing an artwork. And then I turned to her as we're walking away. I said, Cynthia, what do you think that character could be saying? And she doesn't miss a beat. And she said, she said the line, I'll see you again soon, or I'll be back. I'll be back. That's what it was. I'll be back. And as soon as she said that, it fits so well with that image of the painting, which I, uh, sorry, audience, <laughs> you, have this, like, hey, well, you don't even know what we're talking about. Um, <laughs> it fits so well that tears started to come. Mm -hmm. Tears started to come, but it was yeah. the contribution of somebody else to my experience. And we weren't even looking at the artwork at that moment. I glanced back and saw and just reaffirmed. But the, the point I want to make here is that these emotional moments were, were not the initial, the artwork hits me over the head. The mm -hmm. emotional power came when I was contemplating or when I was having a conversation about the artwork and some new insight came from that. Well, there, there's That's a lovely. wealth of observations yes, there. Even, even observations. just the fact that you can do art, that you can consume art as part of a group and have conversations and insights might occur to you that wouldn't have occurred to you without that conversation. And you're right, you don't read a novel together. <laughs> you, and you even know, in a movie theater, unless you're uh, one of those chatterboxes, and then often you don't get much out of the movie. But yes, consuming yeah. art yeah, and, in a museum. And so Ayn Rand, I'd like to do a little quote here from yeah. her. She says, um, the visual arts produce concrete perceptually available entities that make the, and make them convey an abstract conceptual meaning. And that's, you know, you know, you look at that and you think, oh, it's kind of dry, <clears throat> you know, considering what we're talking about today. But I really, I, I would, I would submit that with that abs that because you're adding to it, and you're even having your friends add to it that that might actually strike you, and you're you're it, you are um, you're participating in that artwork, in the meaning of the artwork, and, and what it means to you, or what what kind of uh, you're you're providing the words to it, and with those words, with those concepts, and with those abstractions, will come the emotions, and yeah, so yeah, that, it's that does sound abstract, but yes, when you consider what it means. Right. Anything. May I add, may I add a, a little caveat to that? An important aspect for me to have those emotions come is certainty. Mm. Is mm. I know it's there. I know it fits. I've put together the pieces of the story. I'm not. I'm not just making something up to, uh, to top off what I'm seeing. I'm not using the artwork as a jumping off point for um, my imagination. I'm using my imagination in service of bringing that artwork to life. And so when I'm bring when I, when that, the reason that quote that Cynthia said resonated with me is because it felt so perfect for the artwork. Mm -hmm. And so that if I don't have the certainty of like, mm, I don't know, then I'm not going to have the emotion. Mm -hmm. Yep. You need to integrate those concepts need to integrate in your mind. Mm -hmm. If you don't have that congruity or that integration, uh, <laughs> if that, those puzzle pieces don't fit together. Yeah. 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 It, it's, you know, when I, uh, one analogy I've used as with a mindset of how to approach the art has been, you got to be Sherlock Holmes, mm -hmm. you, you know, put those puzzle pieces and solve the crime. 
fit everything together. And then Anne of Green Gables as well. Use that vivid imagination to bring it to come, have it come to life and using that, the right brain and left brain, whatever the psychological uh, concepts you jour are, but using both the associative and the analytical mm -hmm. to, to, to make it come to life. Well, we have about uh, 10 more minutes here. Yeah. And uh, because afterwards we're going to be going on to clubhouse and so, so, yes, we have a couple super chats that came in since the last mm -hmm. ones we read. Uh, Gene Walters wants to know, I'm jelly. Any tours in <laughs> California? Hmm. Anything coming up in Cali? Uh, look for tours in California in the spring. Um, so this weekend, I'm going to Denver. Uh, in a week and a half, I'm going to, oh, Detroit. Um, and mm -hmm. then... <laughs> After after the book gets that's printed out and all shipped out um, and, and by the end of February, then I'm going to go on a grand tour you know, up in California. Uh, several art museums uh, in California are are represented in the book. The uh, Getty Center, the uh, the oh, the Cantor Museum of Art uh, in Stanford, the Legion of Honor. So, yeah, California is a destination, northern and southern. Excellent. I was going to save this for the end, but I'll mention it now. Anybody who is near Southeast Michigan, northern end of Ohio, or doesn't mind driving, or if you're here in Motown, the November 21st tours that Luke has given, there are two. One is sold out. One has open, seat, open positions available. You can sign up, contact Luke, or contact me, and I will point you in the right direction. Southeast yes. Michigan, November 21st, yeah, it's, it's Touching the Art, Detroit Institute of Arts. Yes. One of my favorite Training. museums in the United States. Thank you. <laughs> it is, is really a really good one. Uh, I put it, I put the, um, uh, your URL, the, uh, touching out the art.com slash tours into the uh, chat. And then cool. the second super chat from Mary Aline, who not only contributes again, but this time has a question. Will you be at Ocon in DC and will uh, there be art tours after your book? Is there anything left to say about art? Oh my goodness. There's so much to say about art and so, so much more that I I'm, I'm still understanding and I'm only learning by experiencing art with others. Um, I would say that the chances of, uh, me going to DC are 99.837% and the chances of tours are a hundred percent. Compared to California, you're local. <laughs> yeah. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> Very good. Excellent. And then one more, since we're doing these super chats, I do have to remind people that we're on the Ayn Rand Center UK's channel. Everybody listening is probably already a member, but if you're not, you should sign up because you're missing out on a few things that are not on YouTube. S specials like the Don Watkins Communication Bootcamp and James Valiant's discussions about Leonard Peikoff's advanced courses. So if you're not already a member, go to aynrandcenter.co.uk. Link will show up in the chat in a moment. Sign up. You can sign up for anywhere from 10 to 100 pounds a month. Yeah, that's pounds because Ayn Rand Center UK. And absolutely worth it if you're not already on board. Either way, your super chats also contribute to keeping the center running mm -hmm. and are very, very much appreciated. So we get from touching the art to the latest book, Stories in Paint. Again, the Kickstarter link in order for you not only to support the book, but to reserve a copy of it available in my show notes on facebook.com slash Robert Naser or twitter.com slash Robert Naser. The links are there. And what I wonder is we're knee deep in the middle of it, but you mentioned you still have more to learn. And I'm curious, do you have any sneak peeks on, well, after Stories in Paint, what comes next? Do you have any other projects, any other irons in the fire that, uh, that you can give us any sneak peeks of? Yeah, I, I'm not going to count my chickens before they hatch, but I will. <laughs> Um, <laughs> well, you blew the Kickstarter out of the water. Yes. Like, yeah, yeah, yeah we, we just need nine grand to get this running. And like, you know, 36 <laughs> hours later, we're like 15, 15 grand or something. <laughs> That's so great. Um, I, I'm, I'm imagining uh, that the book is a, is a starting point for then an, an app because you mentioned a digital component and then an app that could be constantly updated that maybe has a subscription where... Um, Right now, you're fit. This the book is limited to 50 artworks at a dozen or so museums. Then I've given tours at I don't know 40 museums in the United States. Um, and so I've got recommendations of artworks for all of those. Mm -hmm. And so this would be something like a, a, an app 
where you could go to the art museum, have me there with you as part of a self-guided tour on your on your phone and could be continuously updated. So that's one thing I have in mind. Excellent. Well, that's 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 the key too, to success is you know, revenue streams. But since you mentioned it, I'm curious, have you ever made a list or, or just a count of how many museums in the United States you have visited and specifically with, with this art experience in mind? Do you have um, any idea? Yeah, I I'm going to I'm going to throw a wild guess out there and say 63. Wow. <laughs> it's it's it, it's it's close to that. It's when I thought that. of that, I thought, well, have you, how many art museums have you seen outside the United States? A lot Ooh. as well. Well, it might yeah. not be obvious to people, but you have French origins. So obviously. Is it not obvious to people? I thought it would be very, very plain, <laughs> no? Obviously the Louvre, but where, are there other <laughs> countries you, you where you have say... done art hunting? Oh yeah. England. Yes. London. I love London. I went there a few summers ago for the first time. Art museums, they're all over and Italy and Greece um, and Germany. Um, I need to get to Spain. I really do. I need to get to the low countries. I need to get to the Netherlands and Belgium. So mm -hmm. I've got a lot to do. Um, but yes, uh, I will show up at your door where if you are somewhere in the world and you want to go to an art museum with me, let me know. I'll show up at your door and we'll go to an art museum. And it's not that hard. If you've got uh, a social group of any kind, it doesn't have to be an objectivist group. It could be a Toastmasters group. Yeah. Let them know about this experience. You get enough people yes. involved, enough to you know, pay for an airline ticket and uh, the cost of doing business. Mm -hmm. It can be done. We've done it. And it's absolutely worth it. Just double checking our chat. We've got some great stuff in the regular chat, although I haven't had time to read everything. Now, Robert and Amy, I, I do have some mm -hmm. of the book here with me if you'd like to get a little bit of a sample teaser. Yes, please. please. I'd love to see it. If you're prepared to share it, we are prepared to see it. We would love that. Okay, so what I propose is I'll share with you an artwork and then maybe ask you a few questions and like our, our little group can can figure, can read it together and then I'll share my reading. All right. Excellent. Uh, oh, um, so by the way, I like you. If you haven't been on one yeah. of the tours yet, you're going to get a little bit of what you get on a touching the art tour. And and I so, lied to you. I lied to you. I, I said all these artworks were were part of you know the tours I've given. Right. This one is not. There's one that's not in this this one. Is it's this one that spanking new? This is one that I've never given on a tour before. Oh, <clears throat> so wow. so we're we're you're we're experimenting a little bit here. Good. I like it. It's spontaneous and special. I love and, it. And this is not a typical one because it's gonna look like there's nothing going on in this artwork. It okay. really is. Are you ready for it? We are ready. Okay, so the first question I'm going to ask you once I show it to you is this first question I ask everybody on any art tour and any art encounter is what's your initial title? And that's the first line that you're going to see in, for each of the artworks in the book. What's your initial title for the artwork? Okay. So better if you don't know the artist's title first. Absolutely. Yeah. Good. That spoils the ending. You see it? Mm -hmm. I do. Mm -hmm. What's your initial title? And it is on YouTube too. And it's beautiful. Yeah. I've got my title. Oh, let's hear it, Amy. The Glorious Nap. Oh, <laughs> <laughs> that sounds like my afternoon. <laughs> I, I have to admit, I find the image a bit overwhelming and the title is not coming to mind. That's, um, that's just fine. That's just fine. And, and you know what? Beautiful. That first word you used, that's fantastic or overwhelming. That can also be because the title is not necessarily what's going on in the image. It's your emo immediate re emotional response and the content of the image fused together. Okay. I've got a few questions for you. You ready? Yes. Okay. Huh? These are going to sound really strange. Okay. Good. What's, what's going on in this story? What is she doing? Is she about to go to sleep? No. I would say yes. <laughs> <laughs> Fantastic. Um, I love it at the beginning. We've got some drama. I can imagine we, that, but no. I'm, okay, I'm so now what you do is you arm wrestle. And then yeah. whoever wins, they, we, that's the way it goes. Mm. No, 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 she's, no. Uh, she's, not, <laughs> she's not dressed for rest. Mm -hmm. She's looking down in a contemplative way. She is laying down. This is this is she's not in a position to take action, but she does not look restful to me at all. Hmm. She's got something on her mind. Mm. All right. She does look a, a tad bit flushed. Mm. 
Okay. Uh, perhaps she's trying to calm herself down. Mm. All right. Here's the next question. And uh, yes. I'm realizing the time, so I'm going to go through these more quickly than we would normally in our okay. in mm -hmm. a little bit of an art chat. Um, where is she? Is there anyone around her? I don't think so. I think she's in her bedroom, but uh, or in a lounge or something like that. I think it's quiet where she's at. But I see, I don't know because of the way that uh, what she's resting on is conforming to her shoulder. It doesn't look like a pillow. Um, but it's a cushion of some kind. Mm -hmm. So I don't have the impression that she's in bed. Okay. Um, or if she is, then her, her bed linens are still covering everything up and she's, she's not really in a position for bed. And again, she's not dressed for bed. Mm -hmm. What time of day is it? Night? Day? Seems plenty bright. Yeah, it's daytime, I think. What textures do you feel? If you were to, to touch... Cotton, would... a lot of cotton. You think? <laughs> yeah. I mean, it's got it's got that slight <laughs> sheen to it. Again, it 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 doesn't look to me like a um, you know pillowcase. Or I it... think it's cool. I think it like it cool to the touch, not warm. Yeah, it's got that sheen. Mm -hmm. Any more textures? Um, well, I mean, I don't know how comfortable she is wearing what she's wearing. Um, She's got a pin, you know, that, that goes up onto her shoulder that's basically connecting another part of the um, dress that she's wearing. Yeah, and the hair is rendered in a very sensual fashion. You can practically feel that hair. Mm -hmm. And uh, that's extraordinary. What kinds of things could she be thinking about? If she were to speak, what could she say? What would she say? Leave me alone. I don't know. It's the looking down that makes mm. it look contemplative to me. Mm. And she is thinking about, I don't know what she's thinking about, something that happened. I would almost think somebody that she misses, but it's got that, it, that personal sense of she has something to do with what she's feeling. She's mm. trying to make a um, difficult decision. Mm. Could be. All right. Are you ready for my reading? Yes, yes. Please. So I'll give you the structure of my reading is the first portion is me going through the details and kind of answering a lot of the questions we've been talking about. Then I'll, I'll share the title and how that might or doesn't, titles are finicky things, mm -hmm. uh, affect the, the meaning. And then the pivotal part at the end is when we're going to ask ourselves uh, to empathize with her. Mm -hmm. All right, so here we go. A beautiful young woman lowers her eyes in quiet reflection. Her bundled russet brown hair almost hides her dark eyes and aquiline nose. Her full rosy lips part slightly while the soft skin of her neck is exposed in the caress of sunlight. Her head and shoulders seem enveloped in a dappled purple haze, like there's a twilight sunset surrounding her thoughts. But it's not a vista behind her, it's a cushion whose indentations show that her head has been nestled within its softness. She's lying down, not standing up. Is she going to bed? Is she about to go to sleep? The light around her seems too vibrant to be emanating from a candle, and she's dressed in a multi-layered outfit with intricate small clasps, and perhaps those dark eyes and red lips are still made up. She's not gotten ready for bed. It looks like she has lied down, perhaps in the afternoon, on her cushioned sofa. It looks like this is her spot, maybe a favorite spot, because the violets and mauves of the cushion match those of her dress. She doesn't look dressed up to go out anywhere, though. She's comfortably alone on her favorite cushion in her favorite dress by herself with her thoughts. Mm -hmm. What is she thinking about? She's not excitedly looking forward to the next day, and she's not deeply sad. She seems reflective and melancholic. She's not lying on her back with her eyes facing upward while her mind races with thoughts, like what happens to me when I'm lying back in bed trying to fall asleep. Rather, she's turned to the side, lying on her right shoulder. Her mind isn't not racing. 
it's settled on something. Is she thinking about a career opportunity she missed out on? Is she thinking about her parents that she misses? Or is she thinking about a lover who is not there with her? She looks so beautiful. And, uh, and sensual. And she feels all these sensations around her. The velvety cushion, the warm sunlight, the strands of hair in her forehead, and even perhaps a dab of perfume she might be wearing suggests to me she's missing her lover, a lover she wishes could be lying there beside her. When have you taken a moment of rest in the middle of your day to allow yourself to reflect on something that you were missing? Perhaps coming home after a day's work, you go for a walk outside in the late afternoon sun, stop and lean against a tree, thinking of how much you'd like to be with him, the one you love. The title of the painting mm -hmm. is interesting. It's Far Away Thoughts. Ah, uh, yes. Yeah. I think it's a lovely title. It is a good title. And it Whatever is around. Much. Whatever is around her right now, not the rest of the room, not the world outside, not even the edges of the couch, it doesn't matter. Only the purple of her longing thoughts does. I can imagine her thinking to herself right now, would it be too much to ask that you were here beside me? Mm. And perhaps she'd raise her eyes slightly hoping to see his face beside hers, to meet his gaze, and to feel his hand reach over and caress her cheek. That's very beautiful, Luke. A, lot, you, of things, a lot of things came up into my mind. We don't, I don't think we have too much time here because we're going to... Uh, be going to clubhouse but um if anybody has any 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 last comments or, or questions super chats preferably for luke please go ahead and put those in so everybody who's already on your kickstarter is saying okay i did the right thing and anybody who's not yet <laughs> is ready to jump over there yes and uh, the link is in the chat and support this work that is uh that is an extraordinary example of exactly what you've done for us several times in the past and so many other people. So folks, I, you can see why we were determined to talk to Luke. I have to say, your voice Imagine is so nice when you're, when you're reciting that, when you're giving your reading. So- Yes. Yeah, I love that. And uh, is, is, there, is, is that part of the book? You're reading yes, it is. What? Yes, <laughs> yes that's, that, I just read from the book, straight from the book, yeah. Well, that's um, that's just it's very very unique project yeah. that you put together, and I wish you the absolute best and absolute just booming success with this. So, folks, you can see why we we could not resist the opportunity to talk to the irreplaceable Luke Travers. <laughs> yes. When when we talk about life on Earth, you know, sometimes that sounds. Oh, it sounds very practical and very uh, staid and serious. And <sighs> it's easy to forget that we're not talking about that. We're talking about power and passion. And, uh, you know, when Ayn Rand says that art is the irreplaceable medium for the communication of a moral ideal, mm -hmm. that also sounds kind of abstract and we forget what, what what does a moral ideal mean oh it means a hero it means howard rourke yeah but it doesn't just mean that it means the, the living of a rich life that's what morality is living a good life a passionate life a powerful life and uh, luke you have given us uh, a bit of that your book is going to give us a lot more and again a reminder for folks luke will be in southeast michigan on the weekend of the 20th he has an open session on the 21st that morning. One more chance for folks who've already done it or for folks who haven't and are ready to lose their, their art appreciation virginity <laughs> on Sunday morning, the, uh, November 21st. I love your Luke laugh. Your laugh. 
So Luke, I have one more question yeah. for you. One of my favorite questions to ask, and that is, what's the one question you wish I had asked that I haven't asked you yet? Mm. Um, here's what came into my subconscious or what my subconscious said me. First thing was, what's my favorite pizza topping? Second thing is, um, what artworks do I especially like? Myself. If you answer the first one, it could be a heartbreaker if you say pineapple. So I'm going to let that go. <laughs> it's not pineapple. Oh, okay. Well, then, oh, what is it? What then is bring it? it on. Don't tell me it's anchovies. Oh, it's no, no, no. It's uh, grilled onions. Oh, wow. Well, there you go. Well, Very I think good. the second question might be more important, except if you're coming over to our house. <laughs> <laughs> and what, what again was the second question that popped into your mind from, the your, second one was, um, from your fertile subconscious? Uh, yeah, it's, it's all kinds of different seasons going on in there. Sometimes it's definitely winter. Uh, <laughs> the, so it, uh, you know, what's, what's, what's an artwork I love? What's, you know, what, I, um, what's a favorite artwork that mm -hmm. I guess. Do you play favorites when it comes to artworks? What, what comes up for you? Um, yeah, I, I kind of do play favorites some, so I, I have like, you know, the Last Mohicans is my first answer when I think of favorite movies. The Fountainhead mm -hmm. by Ayn Rand is my first answer when I think of uh, of novels. Um, but it, it it's not the favorite. Also, is not not necessarily the one that I'm kind of it really matters to me at the moment. Um, but it's something that maybe has stayed with me over time and has evolved with me over time, or I keep going back to it at different points in my life uh, mm -hmm. and getting more out of it. I I think you know Michelangelo's David is is up there. Mm -hmm. Uh, that's been one that I've initially kind of struggled with and then have grown to appreciate. And I've gone back to it over and over again because I've had more to tell David about the moments that uh, I had that I shared with him that I could empathize him even more. So did, did you see the work in person? Oh, I have. Yeah, I have. Uh, yeah, a few times. Um, but but he, he doesn't need I don't need to see him to have a conversation with him. I can just kind of, you know. So, hey, David, how's it going? Yeah. So when you felt competent um, and you felt an enjoyment of teaching algebra, did you feel like you also uh, slayed the giant? <laughs> well, the, the thing is that, you know what, it's I, the, the Michelangelo's David, very interestingly, is not after he slayed the giant. Mm. It's the moment right. before he right. steps right. forward to slay the giant. So wow. that kind of anxiety and fear of the unknown. Mm -hmm. that that's something that I experience a lot of. And when I'm trying to tackle a big project, like, you know, writing a huge book, then I haven't written in 10 years. And my <laughs> tendency is to not finish projects. I kind of like feel like, Hey, David, can you give me some support here? Because I know you, you did it. And I want to, you know, <laughs> yes. be like you. Congratulations on your wonderful David moment and, uh, and actually getting through it to the end. Well, it's um, still got more. It's still got more. Still got Goliath to slay along the way. Okay. <laughs> well, this this has been a, an invaluable conversation. Absolutely delightful, and, Luke. And for anybody who's thinking, I wish this conversation wouldn't end. Mm. Remember, I said Luke will be in Southeast Michigan, November twenty first. We're going to drag him onto our other podcast, Five Minutes with Robert Naser, and we will interview him all over again. But it will be a whole mm -hmm. different interview because, yes. as Luke says, he never runs out of new things to say. Luke, this has been an amazing <laughs> conversation. Again, links to everything you want to know about Luke. Well, not everything, but all the, the highlights <laughs> that you want to know about. You couldn't make enough links for that. And, and this is a family show after all. <laughs> but links to the things that we have talked about on my Facebook wall, on twitter.com slash Robert Naser, facebook.com slash Robert Naser. Everything you want to know about Luke, his websites and all the links that he will send you to Everything is worth reading. Everything is worth uh, investigating. And once you do that, you will find your favorite artworks take on a new life. And artworks you haven't seen yet will, will the bounty, will, I don't even know the right words. It will all just, it makes everything better. Luke, mm -hmm. you make everything better. Today, you've made our show better. Thank you so much for joining us. Thank you, oh. Luke. I love thank you, you, Luke. I love you too, Amy. <laughs> and thank you for having me. And thank you for the pleasure of your company. So and what we're going to do is we're going to wrap up. Thank you so much. We're going to go over to Clubhouse and talk some more. 
And you now, not only can you chat with us, you can literally chat. I don't even know how to make the distinction between YouTube <laughs> chat and Clubhouse. Let's do it. Let's now thank you, you good people. And we will see you on Life on Earth in one week. Yeah.